feel about that influence that you have. You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from one until three this afternoon. Coming up on the show, Border Force teams are poised to rescue 200 Britons trapped in Gaza as Rishi Sunak wishes for a pause in the fighting to allow aid to reach besieged Basilia, but, sorry, Palestinians. Spit it out eventually. Uh, meanwhile, the government has apologised to me after a unit monitoring social media during the pandemic labelled me a vaccine sceptic in a report they then shared with US counter-terrorism officials. And Crispin Blunt has named himself as the Tory MP arrested on suspicion of rape and drug possession. But he denies the charges and says he was the one who originally raised the incident with police as he was concerned about extortion. All that coming up over the next couple of hours. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Julia. Good afternoon. A United Nations official says Gaza is being strangled, claiming food, water and fuel are being used to punish more than two million people as supplies run out. Six lorries carrying medical and water purification supplies have now arrived in Gaza with more trucks on the way. But aid workers say it's not enough. Well, it comes as the Prime Minister has announced that UK border force teams are now in Egypt to help get around 200 British nationals out of Gaza. Well, the Israeli military has confirmed the number of hostages being held in Gaza is 229. Professor Anthony Glees, a security expert at Buckingham University, has told Talk TV Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing a difficult decision. He is, uh, I'm sure, racked by guilt uh, and above all, driven by revenge. Now, that is not a good way for Israel to deal with this issue of getting those Hamas jihadists and eliminating them. Uh, what people want is justice, I think, not revenge. But I suspect there will be an occupation. Police hunting for a man suspected of shooting dead 18 people in the U.S. state of Maine have searched the homes of his relatives for a second time. Robert Card, an army reservist, is said to be armed, dangerous and on the run. A boat he owned is also said to be missing. His neighbour, Richard Goddard, says it's hard to get to grips with what's happened. It's never, it won't be the same. Nothing's going to be the same. I feel so bad for his father what he's going to go through, his, the rest of his family, you know, it's, it's not their fault, but it's going to, it's going to fall on them. There's no getting around it. It's going to fall on them. Nigel Farage has called a review into NatWest, which found serious failings over his treatment are whitewashed. He found the main reason the former UKIP leader's account with its private arm Coots was closed was because it was unprofitable, with his political views being supporting factors. It's estimated the number of people living with dementia will double in the next 17 years. A study by the University, well, University College London forecasts that 1.7 million of us will have it by the year 2040, putting it down to widening inequalities and unhealthy lifestyles. Graham Sutherland is a dementia campaigner and his mum has the condition. She can like, touch her nose, um, putting a seatbelt on, just feeding herself. Her speech started to go away. Now she can barely say a word. Um, her mood, she gets very upset, very scared easily. The surge for four people who went missing after two ships crashed off the coast of Germany has now been called off. The crew members were on board the British cargo vessel named Verity, which sank following the collision on Tuesday morning. One person died while two others remain in hospital.
And Wilco stores are set to return to the high street before Christmas. The discount chain was brought by a rival store in the summer and its new owner is opening up to five shops with the first two confirmed in Plymouth and Exeter. It comes just weeks after the retailer shut its doors, leading to the redundancy of almost all of its 12,500 workers. Well, that's the latest. Now time for today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it's an unsettled picture in the days ahead. We're going to see showers and some longer spells of rain. In fact, we're already seeing the showers and they're circling around western areas, whereas we've got an easterly drift, which is bringing rain into eastern Scotland, precisely the place that we don't want it. Uh, and that rain's going to continue, possibly another 100 to 150 millimetres over the next few days. Elsewhere, though, sunshine and showers. Some of those showers could be quite sharp and thundery. Temperatures not particularly spectacular for the time of year, ranging from around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's 59 Fahrenheit. This evening, the rain continues over Scotland. We also see rain returning to east and coasts. Through central areas, the winds fall light and we like to see mist and fog forming there. Showers elsewhere. In fact, those showers really pepping up over parts of the southeast. And again, we've got a yellow warning there where we could see between 50 and 70 millimetres of rainfall. And then as far as Saturday is concerned, the rain continues over these uh, eastern and northeastern areas. Still those showers down towards the southwest. Sunshine and showers elsewhere until later in the day when we start to see some further rain coming in from the southwest and temperatures which is about average for the time of year. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thank you so much for joining me. Lots coming up this afternoon. We'll be getting the latest on the attempts to get 200 Brits currently standed in, stranded in Gaza out of the region, as well as the government formally apologising to little old me for branding me a vaccine sceptic in a report that the Cabinet Office decided to share with the US uh, counter-terrorism unit. Hmm. Rather intriguing, isn't it? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, my question to you today is about that topic. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll talk more in detail, but you may well have seen newspaper reports. The government's COVID disinformation unit monitoring critics. We know scientists, MPs, journalists, including uh, me during the pandemic. Uh, I was branded a known vaccine sceptic at one point. Uh, that information was even shared with the US counterterrorism unit. I've now received a full apology. But how many other people did this affect? And why were they doing it? Why was taxpayers' money spent on all of this during a pandemic? When all we were doing was raising concerns and asking questions, which we're supposed to do in a democracy. And certainly when you're a journalist or an MP, it's your job to do that. So I want to know your reaction to that news. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Moving on now, though, to our top story. And the UK has sent border force officials to Egypt's Rafa crossing to help evacuate Brits still trapped in Gaza. Around 200 citizens have contacted the Foreign Office asking for help to leave the besieged region uh, since October the 7th and the Hamas massacre in Israel. Rishi Sunak has been calling for a pause in fighting in order to bring them out and bring them home. But more than 80 MPs have now urged the government to go further and demand a ceasefire, with London's Mayor Sadiq Khan, the latest politician, to join those calls, a decision that Rishi Sunak says would only benefit Hamas. Israel has a right to defend itself, to target those responsible for the appalling terror attack of the 7th of October and to take action to free the hostages. But a widespread military escalation will only deepen the humanitarian disaster. It will increase human suffering on all sides. No nation, including Israel, has the right to break international law. Well, some of us might think that Sadiq Khan should spend more time worrying about the city of which he is actually in charge of, uh, where we have uh, seen oh, an awful lot of uh, uh, young people and many others having to live with uh, the 
the peril of knives and guns on our street. Maybe he should worry more about them than what's going on the other side of the world. But there we are. Uh, joining me throughout today's show is commentator Sam Armstrong. Um, just a quick thought on that, actually, before we go to our first guest down the line, Sam. Um, because I mean, there's so many politicians that get their tuppence worth in on every topic. Now, OK, I do that too. That's my job. And, and, and as my friends and family can testify, I'm like this off air, probably even worse. Um, but every time I see a politician, particularly those on the left, sort of getting onto their soapbox, like Sadiq Khan does, on every international issue, oh, it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or whatever it is, he's on that soapbox um, and he's making some international point. You think, you've got a city to run, mate. Why don't you just get on with doing the job you've got? And when you've sorted that out, then maybe have an opinion on other things. I'll tell you why for free, because virtue signalling is an awful lot easier than governing. Yeah. It's far easier for him to say Israel should do X or Y than it is for him to actually put police onto the streets, for him to actually come up with strategies to deal with many of the problems, for him to stop conducting active warfare, in my view, against the motorists of London that are trying to go out there and earn a living, it's far easier for him to say, oh, this is an outrage, this is a disgrace. Yeah. And by the way, The Guardian, the BBC, all the rest of them, they'll all be crowing, how wonderful, how great, yeah. what a true statesman. Give me a break. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Right, well, look, let's uh, talk now to my guest down the line, Chris Parry. He's the former NATO commander and joins us. Good afternoon to you, Chris. Hello, Julia. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, retired Admiral, of course. And uh, look, you, you've been involved at many different levels, including in the Ministry of Defence, uh, as well as out on the high seas yourself, um, dealing with uh, defence issues in this country. When we talk about um, uh, uh, people calling for a pause, we've had EU leaders, well, 27 of them, calling for a pause, a cessation in uh, airstrikes and violence. Uh, we've got 80 MPs, largely Labour MPs, uh, in, in the House of Commons, including some front benchers, calling for this, the likes of Sadiq Khan, usual suspects. Uh, even the Prime Minister, they're saying they want a pause, not a ceasefire, a pause. These are very different things. What, what is the purpose of that? What does it actually mean? What's the difference between a pause and a ceasefire and what will that achieve? Well, under international law, a ceasefire means that both sides are prepared to uh, stop attacking each other. Um, but the fact of life is a lot of these witless politicians, I'm afraid, don't understand the law of armed conflict. They don't understand anything about warfare, to tell you the truth. Um, if you look at the situation in Ukraine, We've been saying that a ceasefire only rewards the aggressor. Uh, and the same is true here with Hamas uh, and what is going on uh, with Israel. Uh, we saw the worst crimes known to man committed on the 7th of October. And yet uh, all these virtue signaling uh, politicians and others who want a ceasefire don't mention in the same breath that Hamas needs to release the hostages. There's no proportionality here uh, at all. So the basis for negotiations or a ceasefire don't exist. Now, my own experience in the Balkans is that you can actually hold the two sides apart in order to evacuate people in whom you have an interest, in this case, British citizens, if they want to come. Um, but I'm afraid to say that it does rely on the goodwill yeah. and also uh, some armed might to make sure that people don't interfere with that. Yeah, indeed. And that's, it's, it's fascinating, the idea that there's going to be a level of trust from, say, the Israelis uh, in the Hamas terrorist group, given what happened just a matter of weeks ago. It seems quite bizarre. I, I'm, I'm quite, I mean, intrigued almost, actually, by the, the trust that so many people in the international community and, the, say, the virtue signals that Sam Armstrong talked about, uh, the armchair generals, of which, of course, I am one, um, the, their trust in sort of, look, if, if you can stop the airstrikes, if you can get some aid in, then we've got a better chance of getting those hostages back. I mean, Hamas could release the hostages right now if they chose. Hamas could have not taken the hostages if they chose. They took the hostages for a reason, because they wanted to use them as a bargaining chip, particularly taking babies, children, elderly women. It wasn't like they just said, everyone here. They deliberately picked out people... Uh, we saw them paraded around on, you know, on, on, on cars and on motorbikes. Like. They, they took them so they could use them as a bargaining chip for the airstrikes, which they knew would be coming once they'd committed that horrific massacre on October the 7th, didn't they? Yeah, it's a, it's a blatant contravention of every law known to man. And yet, as I said, the politicians that are loudly proclaiming that they want a ceasefire don't in the same breath say, release the hostages and some of this goes away. I think we need to be very clear here, Julia, the Israelis, from what I can see, are conducting highly precise strikes on targets that have military value. 
uh, they're being scrupulously careful there to avoid collateral damage. The munitions they use are specifically designed to explode upwards uh, and not sideways. And you can compare and contrast this with what the Russians are doing right now in Idlib in Syria. They are absolutely devastating uh, bits of cities. Uh, totally indiscriminately, uh, they're using munitions that have wide area coverage, and the United Nations hasn't got a word to say about that. Mm. And all I can say is, you know, you can see a pronounced anti-Semitism uh, descending on international relations at the moment. Is that how you interpret it? Because, I mean, the, the, the criticism and the, of Israel, everything they do... And look, I don't agree with everything the Israeli government has done in the past or is doing now, but the criticism of Israel and the standards to which Israel is expected to adhere is just completely of a different, you know, magnitude than, than yeah, any I other mean, country is held to. Yeah, I mean, one of the frequent tropes we hear is that Gaza is a prison. Well, you know, I've got news for the world. If you're surrounded by hostile neighbours and you're having to think you may be attacked any minute on any one of seven fronts, and that's the case today, then you're living in a prison too. Um, so I think we have to consider it from all sides, not just from uh, what I would say is, is the fairly conventional liberal view that Israel's bad and every other single Muslim country and regime is good. Yeah, and indeed, again, at any point, Egypt could choose to open the Rafah crossing. There's lots of talk, we mentioned a little bit earlier, the UK border force, they've got teams at the Rafah crossing ready for if and when they can evacuate these 200 people. I have to say, I don't know if this is the same people who are busy evacuating people on dinghies from France. They're very good at that. So uh, maybe they would be quite useful. But I mean, what do you think the chances are we are going to get those 200 British nationals, some of them maybe dual passport holders, visiting family in, in Gaza, of course, unable to leave themselves, but those uh, British relatives able to get in? What do you think the chances are we're going to get those, out, those people out and get them out safely? Well, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, things got to be put in place before they can be brought out safely. Uh, we don't have a safe environment, for one thing. We don't know they actually want to be evacuated. I'm well, we understand the Foreign Office say 200 Brits have, have contacted them. OK, but I'm a bit surprised they're there in the first place because the Foreign Office quite clearly said don't go to Gaza uh, quite a long time ago. Um, but the fact of life is, unless we can create a safe space, probably detached away from where the main fighting is, uh, maybe even the other side of the Rafa border. I don't see how this can be conducted in safety and security. Uh, there's no doubt, as I said, that you actually have to hold uh, a basis of trust on both the Israelis and also Hamas, uh, but also in some of the inter other international partners with whom you're going to have to work as well. Mm -hmm. I suspect it will be negotiated by a third party if we do have a pause. Um, but the fact of life is we it's another opportunity for propaganda by Hamas as well. We need to be very careful of the information coming out about this release and the way it is actually conducted. OK, let's talk about the hostages. We're told, you know, some, I think, latest figures, 229 hostages being held by Hamas, the vast majority of those being civilians. There's some talk from Qatar, even some talk from the Iranians uh, of perhaps possibly release of some 50 uh, hostages. We've had four released so far, four women, um, uh, uh, a, uh, two elderly women, uh, a mother and daughter. Uh, we're told for humanitarian reasons, bizarrely, that doesn't seem to apply to the you know, young babies and, and many others we know uh, who uh, have, uh, have illnesses and desperately need a medication. Um, what do you think the chances are of getting those people out? We believe that five Brits are possibly among those being held hostages. Sadly, a couple of the teenage British girls we thought might have been held hostage, sadly, were now... They're, bodies have been identified in the massacres that happened on October the 7th and that we, they were buried uh, the day before yesterday with their mother. Um, but uh, what, are the op what are the chances of us seeing those people alive and well? Hamas say some 50, they claim, have been killed during those Israeli airstrikes. Um, what do you make of those claims? Well, we can't believe anything Hamas says, um, whether they're alive or dead. We also can't trust them to deliver them up. They may have them. Uh, they may be still alive. They may not be. Um, we've seen a few of the hostages. As you say, some have been released. Uh, but we've got to bear in mind that the husbands of those elderly women uh, are still yep. being held by yep. Hamas. They're being used as not just bargaining chips. They're being used as tactical pieces on the board. It's absolutely uh, antithetical to everything that you and I believe in our free countries. Um, Hamas are disgusting people and some of the worst crimes 
committed by humanity ever were committed on the 7th of October. These are the people we're dealing with. And I'm afraid to say whenever I hear politicians and others just use it as a short preamble before mm. they condemn Israel uh, and want a ceasefire, again, is quite disgusting. Yes, I have to say, I'm a hard and cynical old hack, but every time I read, and I deliberately don't shy away from reading the details of uh, the, the attacks and the, the personal accounts, it, this is so beyond shocking. It's the, the, the brutality, the macabre brutality is, is so horrific. Um, we need to be awake to it. We need to understand. I mean, Jim, this is why, why it's absolutely despicable of the Secretary General of the United Nations to try and bracket yeah. uh, what has happened uh, in Gaza with what happened in, in Israel on the 7th of October. You know, these are crimes way beyond what we normally expect, even in warfare. Um, so uh, without condemning utterly and without qualification, uh, any decent person should avoid... Yeah. Uh, and, and no avoid. moral equivocation. Let me ask you about that because it's been one of the big debates we've been having for the last few weeks is, you know, what is the proportionate response? What is and what is not uh, within the, uh, in, you know, the, the, the rules of war, the international law? And we're told, you know, the killing of civilians is against uh, international law, um, not letting aid in, this, this siege of effectively mass punishment, uh, critics are saying, of the Palestinian people in Gaza. You've been, you're not an armchair general, you're a former rear admiral, you've been at war. What do you make of, of those claims and well, counterclaims? Julia, I also published the law of armed conflict as it applies to British forces back in 2008. The fact of life is siege is a perfectly legitimate way uh, of putting pressure on armed elements up, that are within it. Um, the city is not an open city. It is a city that is militarized at the moment. So it's a legitimate uh, activity to besiege and do what the Israelis are doing. Now, in terms of proportionate, it doesn't mean equal. Mm. Proportionate means make the threat go away. And that's what the Israelis are doing. They're preparing their forces to make the threat go away. And when the threat goes away, then that can be deemed proportionate. I'm afraid there are, again, too many people who are spending too little time studying warfare and the law and spouting about it, Sadiq Khan being the latest. Indeed. Um, Just finally, can I ask you about the US um, airstrikes uh, that we've seen in eastern Syria? Um, uh, the US have said that this was in retaliation for uh, Iranian attacks on US bases in the region. We've seen uh, uh, some of that play out. Um, what are your fears, particularly as we've seen Vladimir Putin, um, allegations that he's sort of setting up a new axis of terror against the West, uh, working with Hamas, inviting Iranian representatives to Moscow as well. We've seen uh, three of the, you know, Palestinian organisations, you know, blatant, you know, terrorist groups like Hamas meeting together um, as well. How concerned are you about the spread of this uh, conflict? Julia, you, know, you and I have spoken over the whole of this year about the fact that the free world is facing an alliance of autocracy between China, Russia, Iran and North Korea. And what we're seeing are the manifestations and symptoms of that alliance against us. Um, we've seen it in Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing it now with Israel uh, and Iran trying to expand its activities into the greater Middle East. And we should expect more in future. And the Americans, with their two aircraft carriers in the eastern Mediterranean in about two days' time, are saying, look, we're not going to see you get away with this. Mm -hmm. And if Hezbollah even thinks of moving in the north, I suspect that 150-odd cruise missiles will be heading towards targets in southern Lebanon uh, very quickly indeed. OK, really good to get your thoughts, get your expertise. Thank you so much, as always, uh, Rear Admiral uh, uh, Chris Parry. Uh, thank you very much, former NATO commander. Um, Absolutely fascinating to get his thoughts. Sam Armstrong, you and I, we are the armchair generals. Um, you know, we sit in our comfy seats in the studio at home, pontificating like a lot of our politicians do, um, not having to make these decisions ourselves. Easy to judge, isn't it? Um, what do you make of this sort of this the risk of this sort of spreading, this conflict spreading wider? And a lot of people just say, oh, we're heading towards World War Three. Everyone stop it now. Is that the solution? Well, let's just get one thing clear. It's not a ceasefire they're talking about. They're talking about a surrender. These were terrorists that organised and arranged a terrorist atrocity, an act of war from tunnels underneath Gaza, where they store weapons, have command and control centres, and organise barbarity, the likes of which we haven't seen uh, perpetrated against Jews since the Holocaust. They went off, conducted their terrorist attack, 
and took Israeli civilians back to those tunnels where they continue to plan further attacks. Israel knows where those tunnels are. Yeah. It knows who is there. And the likes of Sadiq Khan are saying, no, no, yeah, we know that they came and attacked you. We know that they're planning to do it again. But Israel, you should not go and get yeah. those Turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. That is not a ceasefire. I, I, it is a surrender. When, when people talk about what Israel should do again, we talked with Chris Parry about how they're just held to a higher standard than any other country. When I think back to what happened in 2001 with the, with the 9-11 attacks, when I think back to 2005 with the 7-7 tube and, and bus attacks here in London as well, um, I, they were brutal attacks. People died. I mean, 3,000 on 9-11, thankfully, a lot, lot less. I think it was 52 uh, on 7-7. On we're talking about 1,400 people in, in a country far smaller in terms of, you know, this is like 20,000, 30,000 people being slaughtered. Sla but slaughtered, butchered, tortured, raped, eyes gouged out, pregnant women having their babies ripped from them and killed in front of their eyes. We've got video footage of this that independent journalists have seen and have verified. People taken hostage. This was the most medieval-level barbaric pogrom. It's the right word uh, for, for the uh, pogrom for the, for the prime minister to have used. Um, and, and the idea that that would have happened here and that all of these people, the Sadiq Khans, the Labour MPs, would be sitting there saying... Yes, well, we, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing anything to harm the people who happen to be living nearby the terrorists who did this to us. It's a nonsense. Of course we would. I, well, even when people talk about how well, it shouldn't be revenge, it should be self-defence, I think revenge is a completely reasonable response to that crime. Uh, if that was my country, I would... And, and I, I, I've never served, um, like I will never serve. But if that was my country, I would be signing up yeah. tomorrow. To as people, as, as Americans did, en masse, by the way, uh, after 9-11. After Absolutely right. And let's not pretend, just by the way, that this is about protection of Muslims or, or anything else. There are a million Muslims right now in concentration camps in China. Yeah, no one cares about them. Where are the left's? Yeah. Where are the left? No, but also, I find it extraordinary. I don't see any criticism of Egypt for not opening the border. All the people in Gaza who've been told to move from northern Gaza to southern Gaza and to open the border, you know, there's supposed to be this sort of... We're told this sort of, you know, this Arab Brotherhood. I don't think there is a responsibility on Egypt to let them in, but there's no criticism of Egypt for not letting them in. There's no criticism of all these other countries in the Middle East, none of whom have offered to take in any of these people. Now, they may not want to leave. I've got to be honest with you, if I was in Gaza, like, pff, I'd want to leave. Yeah, um, um, by the way, civilian casualties that happen in Gaza are not Israel's fault. Let me tell you whose fault they are. They are Hamas's, yeah. who use hospitals, schools and housing blocks as the few centres that they do have yeah. above ground. It's them who are responsible for each and every death yeah. in Israel and each and every death in Gaza. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more on this. Um, look, if you want to get in touch uh, on this, do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. We are going to be a little later in the show uh, talking to Conservative MP Bob Seeley. We're also uh, going to be talking uh, more about a uh, story which I've been asking questions of you about. We talked about Israel so much. But in terms of the government's COVID disinformation unit, which uh, monitored critics, including me, uh, during the pandemic, I was branded a vaccine sceptic. They even shared information about me the US counter-terrorism unit. I received an apology uh, for that from the government in the last week. I just want to know what your reaction is to all of that. You've been getting in touch uh, on X, whatever we're calling it this week, uh, and by text and on your calls. Rick has got in touch to say, complete madness and control. They should be held to account for this invasion of free speech with censorship. Jackie says we should be deeply concerned about tactics normally used in China by democratic governments on supposedly free citizens. Keep your responses coming in. I'd love to uh, uh, hear more from you. You can give us a call on 0344 499 You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. I have to say, this does actually relate, actually, to what we're talking about in terms of war. Just saying, Sam Armstrong, this did expand. We went to war. How the government behaved over COVID, well, it was to keep us safe. <clears throat> they had to monitor us. They didn't want disinformation, misinformation. In fact, most of it was coming out from SAGE and from the government themselves. But I do find it extraordinary. You think people think, oh, well, it's all done and dusted. If we were in a war situation, people speaking up on this issue, will they be monitored in the same way? Will they be smeared in the same way by the government for saying something critical of the government policy? It's a genuine concern, isn't it? Yeah, and let's be clear, one of the strengths that the Western world, that the democratic free world has, 
is criticism, is dissent. It's not a problem. It's not a weakness. It's not a fault. It's part of the system. It's, it's yeah. why we don't it's our go strength. making huge mistakes like Russia and China, yeah. invading countries that they have no chance of winning a war in. Exactly. Well, there we are. we'll talk about that a bit later. Keep your messages coming in. Coming up after the break, the government, as I say, has apologised to me after that uh, uh, monitoring of me. Uh, we'll be talking about that up next. This is Talk Breakfast. No, it's not Talk Breakfast. It's Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the government has apologised to me after a unit monitoring social media during the COVID pandemic grounded me a known vaccine sceptic in a report they then went on to share with a US counterterrorism unit. The Cabinet Office has now admitted this report was inaccurate and not impartial. Joining me right now to discuss all of this is Silky Carlo. She's director of the Civil Liberties Campaign Group, Big Brother Watch, which discovered the report during a probe into the government's counter-disinformation activities during COVID. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Silky. Uh, Sam Armstrong, of course, is also still with us. Um, here's, my, uh, here's my letter of apology from the Cabinet Office, which you helped me get. Great help from you. You've been monitoring all this stuff, and we, we published, you know, published a report, and we, and we discussed the report on the show previously um, about what the government was doing during this COVID period. Just to take us back, just briefly, can you tell us who, what, what units were there and what was the, uh, what was the ostensible purpose of these groups during the COVID pandemic years? 
Well, as soon as the pandemic started, we saw these units pop up across government that claimed to be countering disinformation, but that had very broad, loosely worded remits, no accountability, no oversight, no legal powers. And um, it was clear that some of these units were also sending stuff to social media companies to be removed. So censorship units as well. We immediately So they were thought... monitoring stuff that was public. So like, I would post a tweet, you know, as would many other people and politicians, a speech from Parliament, it would be this was being monitored by these units, paid for by taxpayers' pounds, yeah? Um, and then they would say, ooh, ooh, we think that's, that's disinformation. And then they flag it back to the government and also to, the, to Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or whoever. Yes, that's what we now know. But what they were saying was that, for the most part, they were interested in disinformation, which is, is, is purposeful, uh, deliberate lying. It's deli lying. Deliberate lying it? is the best way to put but, it. But exactly. these units originally, the aim of them was to tackle disinformation that was coming from foreign governments, wasn't it? It was like Russia and China and Iran. Yes, and that's why we thought um, that this deserved investigation. And I'm sure that disinformation is a real problem, and there probably was disinformation from some mm -hmm. hostile foreign states. But what we found in the course of our investigation is that it was domestic dissidents, um, politically awkward people that were asking questions the government didn't want to be asked, mm -hmm. such as yourself, and people that were campaigning for mm -hmm. human rights, the rule of law, yeah. uh, the proper functioning of parliaments. We've seen politicians across yeah. the spectrum, Caroline Democratic Lucas, elected David Davis. politicians. Exactly. Yeah, and scientists. Uh, world leading uh, academics yeah, like that... Carl Hannigan and others. Now you did these uh, organise these subject access requests, very different, uh, sort of much more in depth than say just a freedom of information request, which can, as we know, can easily be sort of, you know, palmed off. Um, and we were able to get an awful lot of detail of, you know, basically what were you saying about me? What were you saying about other people? And I have to say, I was kind of blown away. By, by the number of things they were monitoring. But they were monitoring things, and we discussed it on the show before, even jokey tweets. I mean, really, I mean, jokey things about, like, I once posted a, the colour palette, the Dulex colour palette, for or something, saying, oh, this is breaking news, this is the latest government uh, um, travel uh, rules, because they went from green to red, and then there was amber, and then there was amber plus, and just a, just a joke, mocking the government, because we know in a democracy, again, mockery of stupid policies mm -hmm. is also a fundamental right, and, and serves a very strong purpose. But the, the, the tweets that they didn't like that I wrote was actually a report in the Telegraph about basically the idea was that if children didn't get COVID jabs, by the way, no child who's healthy needed a COVID jab at all, always fought against that. We know even the JCVI was advising, uh, first of all, said they didn't, didn't think children should get them. There was a suggestion that basically they shouldn't be allowed to go to school if they didn't get jabbed, to which I retweeted with no, 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 no. That, they said, meant that I was a a known vaccine sceptic, which of course I wasn't, I was vaccinated myself. Um, I, I regret some of the things I've said about the vaccines. I, I certainly think they shouldn't have been offered to people um, under 50 or 60. Um, but you know, we live and learn. But the key thing is we were able to debate that. But all this time, the government, while sending ministers onto my show, were secretly monitoring me and then smearing me and sending, this is one of the most sinister things, Sending this document to a unit in the White House, a counter, a, a unit that was set up as a counter-terrorism unit to tackle disinformation from Russia and China. Yeah, it's completely mind-blowing. And it, your, this particular case is, is, is particularly remarkable because the unit that claimed to be set up to counter disinformation, primarily foreign disinformation, was actually spreading misinformation yep. about a British journalist across the corridors of power, across UK government, we found they sent 64 government uh, uh, email addresses and the US government. And this US government unit that they sent your tweets to um, was set up, as you say, as a counter-terror unit and then um, purports now to work on foreign propaganda from Russia, Iran, China and North Korea, which um, you're not in any of those countries. Julia. I, I don't, I don't and, think so. Um, you also hadn't spread any disinformation. I think the fact that your tweet just said no goes to show how low the tolerance was for opposition. Yeah. The counter disinformation project lives on, unfortunately, and that's why we're still investigating and challenging. Well, that's it, it. because people still say to me, oh, for goodness sake, let it go, woman. I always say, never forgive, never forget. Because and we just mentioning with Sam Armstrong, we are 
who knows, we may be entering some very dangerous uh, years ahead in terms of Middle East conflict, something spreading. Who just knows what happens with Ukraine, what happens with China and Taiwan in the future. And it is very important that people are allowed to dissent from um, the, the, the official orthodoxy, uh, allowed to criticise government policy, question it, ask for the facts. And if journalists, MPs, scientists and others are basically being smeared, are being questioned as if they are somehow enemies of the state, which is what it feels like I was being treated as, um, for doing our job, for doing our job, doing the job, frankly, that government ministers and civil servants should have been doing. And by the way, the rest of the media and the other MPs and other scientists should have been doing and did not and absolutely failed to do uh, in those years, um, then we are in very sinister territory. So when people say, it's, oh, it's, oh, get over it, love, it's all over and done with, that's your concern, is this is now the norm. Yeah, I mean, what we have today is an acknowledgement from the government that what they did in your case was unlawful, and their words were that it was inaccurate and not impartial. But this function within government is now a permanent function. It's overseen by Michelle Donnellan in the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. And we don't know what the Counter Disinformation Unit is doing now. And like you say, there are some really big topics where there needs to be open and free debate mm -hmm. and dissent within the bounds of the law. So um, this is a a, a crystal clear example. What needs to happen immediately is the counter disinformation unit should be suspended. There should be a full investigation. We know that disinformation is a real problem, but we have to make sure that it's dealt with within the rule of law and in yeah. a way that doesn't mean you're spying on your own journalists and spreading lies yeah. about them to foreign governments. That's the extraordinary thing, isn't it? Um, Sam Armstrong's still with us, and I know you also work with the Street Speech Union and uh, I'm campaigning a lot on this during these years as well. This is the thing. Th this is very sinister. It's creeping. I'm sure that the ministers, the civil servants who set this up were like, oh, we're just trying to save people's lives. And we're always told it's all about saving lives, it's about keeping us safe. And that's always the argument. It's the same argument, though, that despotic tyrants use. Yeah, and look, don't get me wrong. I think what you were doing, Julia, was very inconvenient. It was very annoying for the civil servants, the government ministers that were trying to push through that policy. But it was good for the system because it, what it meant is that their advice, their policies were getting tested. And where we have a real problem is that government officials are so prickly mm -hmm. to scrutiny, even mild scrutiny, that they abuse powers given yeah. to them for very limited purposes, dealing with foreign governments, dealing with terrorism, to go after people that, as I say, no doubt you were inconvenient, but you were helpful. And what we risk losing is actually that internal checks and balances system that means that democratic countries like the UK are, in the long run, far more successful yeah. than and the despotic regimes around the and world. And this is the thing, isn't it? It's absolutely vital that governments do hear that. And we've had that with, you know, the, uh, the, the, the dissenting scientists who were just not being heard and were being, were being smeared. And we know, you know, one of the, someone who's in government right now, Neil O'Brien, he's said up a website to smear me, other journalists, uh, some of the most well-established, world-class uh, uh, scientists like Sinatra Gupta, like Carl Hennigan and others, uh, on a website. And, and he's now a government minister. I mean, I think, frankly, he should, he's, he should be ousted from polite society forever, as I have told him to his face. I, don't think he's, I think he's a despicable human being. I think, genuinely, I don't think you have any business being in government, being an MP, if you're that anti-democratic. But the real worry here, isn't it, we saw after Elon Musk took over at Twitter, now X, um, he allowed independent journalists to come in and look at the internal documents. We saw how much the American government was trying to influence what social media companies were doing, um, ousting people, closing down their accounts, censoring com you know, conversation. And a lot of the time, they were censoring people who actually are now proven to have been in the right on the science. Yes, um, two things to say on that. One is that something we found in the course of our investigation is that 60% of the speech that the counter disinformation unit in the UK was flagging to Twitter didn't even breach Twitter rules, let alone the law. So the majority of the stuff that we've got yeah. civil servants working on is lawful speech. Bear in mind that the rules on Twitter at the time were that if something contradicted World Health Organization yeah. advice, that was against the rules. So we're yeah. talking about Which the lowest possible type of stuff. The other, the other thing to say is that this is a problem across the West. Mm -hmm. um, the US unit that your tweets were sent to is a unit that came up in the Twitter files. What we're seeing, as Sam said, is a real abuse of power under the guise of countering disinformation. Yeah.
I mean, it, it really is very, very sinister indeed. Yeah. That's the word that first came to mind when I saw this. Thank you so much for your hard work on this. You've done amazing work at Big Brother Watch, exposing all of this. And there are a lot of people who won't be aware of it or think, oh, what's the point of it now? This will be improving people's lives in the future, that we know about this stuff, we can counter this stuff, and it is so important that we protect these, these very, very delicate frameworks that our, that our democracy rests on. Um, and the Free Speech Union does that as well. So thank you, thank Mr. Lucky Carlo of Big Brother Watch and also Sam Armstrong, who's staying with me through the rest of the show. Well, I've asked you to get in touch with your reaction to this. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. I'm not trying to make it so, oh, it's all about me, an item about me, but it is quite shocking and it has made a number of the newspapers today. Uh, Nikki has said, if we are only allowed to see, hear and think what the government wants us to see, hear and think, then we are not living in a free country. Exactly. She says, uh, in 2020, any pretense that we lived in a democracy was destroyed. Natasha says, the way that the government used devices to silence you and others was sinister. Exactly the same word I used. And Mark says, I'm not surprised, and many were duped into what the government wanted us to hear and think, while Faye simply says it's an abuse of power. Coming up after the break, Crispin Blunt has identified himself as the unnamed Conservative MP arrested on allegations of rape and drug offences, which he denies. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We're here! Good morning, everybody! Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Mike wins? Wins. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Please. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this girl. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner <laughs> until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, uh, Tory MP Crispin Blunt has identified himself as the unnamed MP arrested on allegations of rape and drug offences. He wrote in a Twitter post last night, 
It has been reported that an MP was arrested yesterday in connection with an allegation of rape. I am confirming that MP was me. The fact of the arrest requires a formal notification of the Speaker and then my Chief Whip. I have now been interviewed twice in connection with this incident, the first time three weeks ago, when I initially reported my concern over extortion. The second time was earlier this morning, under caution following arrest. The arrest was unnecessary, as I remain ready to cooperate fully with the investigation that I'm confident will end without charge. I do not intend to say anything further on this matter until the police have completed their inquiries. Crispin Blunt has since had the Tory whip suspended and has been asked to stay away from the parliamentary estate. Well, joining me now to discuss this is The Sun's political columnist, Trevor Kavanagh. Good afternoon to you. Hi there, Julian. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it does seem to me that another week goes by without another allegation being made about an MP, uh, uh, someone being arrested, someone being charged with accusing convictions. We need to be very, very clear here. This is an arrest. No charges have been brought. He has denied uh, any wrongdoing, clearly stating he was the one who raised this issue with uh, the police three weeks ago. Now, we understand from some of the reports that this relates to um, an, a party, an event at his home in early September. Uh, after he and the uh, the, vic the alleged victim met online, um, and he obviously in that statement referred referenced possibility of of, of extortion. Um, how damaging is this for Crispin Blunt? How damaging is this for the party? Well, it's certainly not a good look for the Conservative Party at this point after two by-election defeats and the possibility of two or maybe more other by-elections in the offing. Um, as you say, Crispin Blunt has yet to be actually charged or uh, or at least put in the dock, and he has said that he will fight it and expects to be acquitted. So we have to wait and see on that one. But the problem for the Conservative Party is it now looks as if it's being buffeted left, right and centre on almost all grounds that you could imagine, whether it's... Uh, on the uh, opinion polls, uh, 20 points behind uh, Keir Starmer, or on the economy with uh, clamouring from Tory MPs for tax cuts, and now on uh, what is really uh, an indication of some sort of sleaze in the Tory party. So whether, um, whether the public is paying much attention to these details in this very tolerant era when there's, there's nothing wrong with being... Uh, gay, it's perfectly acceptable, but of course, if there's an allegation of rape, that takes it a stage further. Yeah. But I think that the overall impression is very bad news for the Tory yeah, party. Yeah, it's just the whole general sleaze. Time. You and I remember the days, you know, with the sort of back to basics with John Major, um, and of course that didn't go down very well because it then became every single bit of a sexual discretion became uh, a, a story. But we seem to have gone from, um, you know, peccadilloes and and affairs or, or or MPs who were married and then finding out that they were gay. That you know, that's no longer a story. That's people's private lives being being gay is sort of an end to your political career as it used to be quite rightly it's no longer that um but the allegations we're hearing you know in the sort of pestminster post you know hollywood me too movement they go way beyond this but the difficulty here is a lot of them don't end in actual action but people's careers are over uh, we did see you know we've got former deputy chief whip chris pincher of course he ended up quitting the commons he was found to have drunkenly groped two men to London Members Club, because that was all part of uh, Boris Johnson's downfall. Uh, we've had um, uh, the Peter Bone, who's suspended from the Commons for six weeks this week, may well be facing a by-election uh, after allegations that he'd bullied uh, a member of staff uh, as well and sort of basically opened the door while he was undressed. Uh, we, we've had other allegations, a Tory MP in his 50s, who's arrested on suspicion of indecent assault, sexual assault, rape, abuse of position of trust and misconduct in public office. He's not been attending the parliamentary estate. Uh, since while well, the investigation is ongoing. Another Tory MP was arrested on suspicion of rape in 2020, never identified, but following an investigation, police took no further action. I mean, I've got to be honest with you, I've worked in a lot of workplaces over the year, years, but um, it does seem to me that there is something going horribly wrong in Westminster. Well, I think it's the era of the grievance culture when it's very easy to point the finger. Uh, these sort of peccadilloes, as you might call them, are... Uh, not confined to the Conservative Party. Well, no, I'm saying uh, they, they were... Are... Peca the, the stories used to be peccadilloes. Now they're about allegations of serious criminal offences. Of course. No, I take the point. Mm. And, uh, but uh, the, the sort of conduct we're talking about is not limited to the Conservative Party, as we will all know. Uh, and as you will know, having worked in the House of Commons, 
Uh, this sort of bad behaviour, what to a greater or lesser degree, is rife across the whole of the parliamentary estate. But what it seems to me to be the case is that the, the finger pointing is coming particularly from those who want to embarrass the Conservative Party and this Conservative government. Now, this may be a, 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 a bit of a conspiracy theory, but I think that they're more ready to listen and to uh, ventilate these sort of charges against Conservatives than they are against oh, really? the party which may form the next government. Well, the only thing is, I mean, these allegations, if you actually look at them across, but there have been a huge number of allegations against Labour people and Liberal Democrats as well, um, and indeed SNP. Um, is, is, there, is there a pestiment to culture? Because I have to say, when I worked in the House of Commons uh, much <laughs> quite, quite a while ago now, one of the things that I saw far more than women being pestered or sexually harassed was actually young women throwing themselves, you know, at, at middle-aged MPs. Um, a lot of drunken yeah. behaviour in bars, a lot of drunken behaviour at party conferences. There was a, a phrase people used to say, PCDC, party conferences <coughs> don't count, which I always found rather shocking, being a little bit of a, a prude on these things. Um, and I just sort of... Um, I, 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 I just think that there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of alcohol and sex going on in this world, rather more than in perhaps most workplaces. Well, I think you're right, uh, Julia. We were in the press gallery together, and I don't think that either of us saw evidence of much more than somewhat peripheral misconduct by MPs who were often trying it on. Well, we would have written uh, about it, if not. I mean, look, look I, I deliberately didn't write about Michael Fallon when he was a backbench Tory MP touching my knee, me having to tell him I'd punch him if he'd carried on doing it. Um, 20 years <laughs> later, the poor man lost his job as Defence Secretary because it went on the front page of The Sun. Yes, but I, I think that things have changed in the age of social media, which makes uh, gives it a sort of turbo charge mm. to the performance. It, the underlying characteristics of the uh, the adult male and female when uh, able to express themselves in the sort of uh, freedom of the House of Commons, which still, despite all of the allegations and uh, revelations about misconduct, continues, if not more than continues, it's getting worse, not better. That's very in interesting you say I, that. Trevor, we yes, I, 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 I do think it's getting worse, and I think the evidence is mounting on that scale. Very interesting to hear that. Trevor Kavanagh, so and columnist, former political editor for some number of years. Thank you so much for joining us. A uh, quick thought from, uh, from Sam on this. Well, very, very, very bad news for Rishi Sunak. Perhaps even worse news for Rishi Sunak than it is for Crispin Blunt. He has kept talking about, Downing Street advisors keep talking about, we're going to have a reset. There's going to be yeah. a moment where we start fighting back. And confidence hit those five so well. pledges and we'll all focus on that. That's right. And every week, it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. And sooner or later, the road is going to run out. And he doesn't catch a break, does he, Sunak, uh, on that front? Uh, but again, it's interesting, even if Crispin Blunt exonerates himself, and again, a lot of these cases don't end up going to court. Uh, and yet, uh, and yet we do see an issue with them. The, the, yeah, the, the, the reputation is already gone. And, that, and that's the trouble with those allegations. Sam Armstrong, more from you throughout the show. We're actually going to talk about one of those Rishi Sunak pledges on uh, the NHS a bit later. Coming up after the break, Border Force teams are preparing to rescue 200 Brits trapped in Gaza if they can get out of the Strip. I'm Julia Honeybrew. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker.
on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from one until three every weekday afternoon. Coming up in this hour, border force teams are poised to rescue 200 Britons trapped in Gaza. This as Rishi Sunak pauses for a pushes for a pause in the fighting to allow aid to reach the besieged territory. Meanwhile, an independent review has found serious failings were made by NatWest in the bank's treatment of Nigel Farrell when his Coots bank account was shut down. But the review ruled that the closure was lawful and based mainly on commercial reasons. Nigel Farage disputes this, obviously, and NHS waiting list could top 8 million by next summer, even if the doctors strike end. That's according to a brand new study. All that coming up over the next hour. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Julia. Good afternoon. A United Nations official says Gaza is being strangled, claiming food, water and fuel are being used to punish more than two million people as supplies run out. While six lorries carrying medical and water purification supplies have arrived in Gaza with more trucks on the way. But aid workers say it's not enough. Professor Anthony Glees, a security expert at Buckingham University, has told Talk TV Israeli Prime Minister is facing a difficult decision. He is, uh, I'm sure, racked by guilt uh, and above all driven by revenge. Now, that is not a good way for Israel to deal with this issue of getting those Hamas jihadists and eliminating them. Uh, what people want is justice, I think, not revenge. But I suspect there will be an occupation. It comes as the United States carried out airstrikes in eastern Syria at two locations linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. The U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, said the strikes were in response to recent attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria by Iranian-backed militia groups. And the strikes were separate to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. There's been no comment from Iran, though. Police are still searching for a man suspected of shooting dead 18 people in the U.S. state of Maine. Robert Card, an army reservist, is said to be armed, dangerous and still on the run. A boat he owned is also said to be missing. His neighbour, Richard Goddard, says it's hard to get to grips with what's happened. It's never, it won't be the same. Nothing's going to be the same. I feel so bad for his father, what he's going to go through, his, the rest of his family. You know, it's, it's not their fault. But it's gonna, it's gonna fall on them. There's no getting around it. It's gonna fall on them. Nigel Farage has called a review into Nat West, which found serious failings over his treatment a whitewash. It found the main reason the former UKIP leader's Coots account was closed was because it was unprofitable, with his political views being supporting factors. The search for four people who went missing after two ships crashed off the coast of Germany has now been called off. The crew members were on board the British cargo vessel named Verity, which sunk following the collision on Tuesday morning. One person died while two others remain in hospital. The UK's first child-friendly city has been revealed. UNICEF UK has announced that Cardiff is the first city in the country to be awarded the status. The award celebrates cities where children's rights have been embedded in policies and services. Well, that's the latest. Now the weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it's an unsettled picture in the days ahead. We're going to see showers and some longer spells of rain. In fact, we're already seeing the showers and they're circling around western areas, whereas we've got an easterly drift, which is bringing rain into eastern Scotland, precisely the place that we don't want it. Uh, and that rain's going to continue possibly another 100 to 150 millimetres over the next few days. Elsewhere, though, sunshine and showers. Some of those showers could be quite sharp and thundery. Temperatures not particularly spectacular for the time of year, ranging from 
from around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's 59 Fahrenheit. This evening, the rain continues over Scotland. We also see rain returning to eastern coasts. Through central areas, the winds fall light and we like to see mist and fog forming there. Showers elsewhere. In fact, those showers really pepping up over parts of the southeast. And again, we've got a yellow warning there where we could see between 50 and 70 millimetres of rainfall. And then as far as Saturday is concerned, the rain continues over these uh, eastern and northeastern areas. Still those showers down towards the southwest. Sunshine and showers elsewhere until later in the day when we start to see some further rain coming in from the southwest and temperatures about average for the time of year. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thank you so much for joining me. If you've not been here for the last hour, why not? Uh, lots more coming up this afternoon. We'll be getting the latest on the attempts to get 200 Britons stranded in Gaza out of the region, as well as fears that NHS waiting lists could top a extraordinary 8 million by next summer. But uh, my question to you today doesn't concern Israel, which is our top story, or uh, any of the other stories we just mentioned. It concerns the story we touched on in the last uh, hour or so regarding the government's COVID disinformation unit. It was monitoring critics, including myself, other journalists, scientists, MPs, during the COVID pandemic when we criticised government policy. An awful lot of which, as we now know from Matt Hancock's WhatsApps, was a load of baloney and wasn't based on any science at all. Well, I was branded in their documents a known vaccine sceptic. This information and other smears about me were shared with a US counterterrorism unit. I kid you not. The reason I know this now is I've now got a formal apology from the government for doing this. Well, the question is, how many other people have they done this to? And why were they smearing a journalist and sending information to a US counterterrorism unit who was simply doing her job asking questions about government policy? I want to know from you, what's your reaction to all of this? Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text me on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Right, moving on from that there, uh, let's talk about our top story. In the UK, sent border force officials to Egypt's Rafa crossing to help evacuate Brits still trapped in Gaza. Around 200 citizens have contacted the Foreign Office asking for help to leave the besieged region since October the 7th, with Rishi Sunak calling for a pause in fighting in order to bring them out and bring them home. More than 80 MPs back here in the UK have now urged the government to go further than a pause and demand a ceasefire, with London's Mayor Sadiq Khan, the latest politician to join those calls, a decision that Rishi Sunak says would only benefit Hamas. Israel has a right to defend itself, to target those responsible for the appalling terror attack of the 7th of October and to take action to free the hostages. But a widespread military escalation will only deepen the humanitarian disaster. It will increase human suffering on all sides. No nation, including Israel, has the right to break international law. Well, commentator Sam Armstrong is still with me here in the studio. We're also joined by Ralph Schollhammer. He's an economist and political theorist at Webster University in Vienna. I'd like to have you both back in the studio. Um, before we get to your thoughts, though, let's uh, on where we are with Israel. Uh, I'm joined now by Conservative MP Bob Seeley. He's a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He's also a former uh, member of the British Arms Forces, serving in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and on the ISIS campaigns. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Bob. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good I know afternoon. I'm used Jordan. to the morning thing. Hey, I said this was talk breakfast a few moments ago. We've no idea what's going on. Let's try and find out what's going on in the Middle East, though. Um, just specifically, let's talk about these 200 Brits trapped in Gaza. We're not talking about uh, hostages. We think that maybe five Britons may be among those hostages. 200 Brits, people, probably many of them having dual nationality passports, pro probably going to visit family members in Gaza. Of course, they can't leave Gaza, uh, so they've been going to visit who are trapped there now. Uh, we know that that many have contacted the British Foreign Office. The UK Border Force have sent teams, they say, to the Rafa crossing if and when it opens again. Um, some aid, trickle has gone in, but it's not open to people leaving Gaza. Um, what are the hopes of getting those 200 Brits who want to leave out of the Gaza Strip? 
I would have thought those uh, hopes are rising all the time because as long as they can get to the Egyptian crossing point with our border folks on the other side liaising, we should be able to get them out. It has taken a long time. It is clearly not great that it's taken so long, but to the government's credit, it is doing what it can in appalling circumstances when Gaza, as we know, is being significantly attacked and bombed by Israel. What do you think the chances are we're going to get the hostages out? We're told, you know, 229, I think, is the latest figure uh, that the uh, Hamas is giving and the Israel is giving um, of those who are believed to be missing, held by uh, Hamas. Although Hamas said they think some 50 of them have died as a result of Israeli airstrikes. We have no way of verifying that at all, of course. Um, and given that they are hostage takers, why would we trust anything they have to say? Um, we're told that Qatar is hopeful that within a week or so we may see some 50 of those hostages, the, maybe the children, maybe the, those who are suffering from illnesses, needing medication, uh, being released. Um, uh, we're told Iran is even involved. Um, Vladimir Putin inviting people to Moscow. He, of course, has some Russian hostages uh, held as well. I think some 25 different nationalities being held. What do you think the hopes are that we will see the vast majority of those people ever leave Hamas Clutch is alive and well. OK, well, the cynical realist in me says that Hamas will probably give a few hostages back um, uh, whilst holding on to many of them. And sadly, I suspect, I suspect that quite a number of them may have been killed already uh, and others are going to be killed either by Hamas or by the bombing. So they are in an awful, awful situation. And although I would want to believe that many more will come out, I, I'm not, I wouldn't bet money on it. The only thing I would say as if Qatar and others are saying to the Hamas, your reputation is being very badly damaged in the Muslim world amongst Sunni Muslims, that might be something that they will take into account. But Hamas, or the logic from Hamas's point of view as a terrorist organization, albeit one with a strong social base in Gaza, sadly, is that they're going to hang on to these people mm -hmm. for the maximum pain yeah. for Israel and the maximum attention for the international um, audience. But this is the irony. The people who are saying, well, we need to have a ceasefire because then we might get the hostages back. The reason why they took the hostages, it wasn't, they didn't accidentally end up with 229 people. Um, they deliberately went to the Israeli civilian settlement to, to take these people, to take women and children and families and elderly people, grandmothers. Uh, they, they did that deliberately because they wanted to use them as a bargaining chip. And, and when the rest of the world, when EU leaders, uh, when 80 Labour MPs here, when Sadiq Khan, the London mayor, when they talk about how, you know, we should have this cessation of hostilities because, you know, it might you know, be better for the Palestinian people on the ground, but also getting hostages back, aren't they playing into Hamas's hands? I was actually just about to use that expression, Julia. Yes, they are. I mean, there's two issues here. One is international law. Israel has the right to defend itself. It mustn't break international law. There are lawyers who would say it's already doing so. There are lawyers who would probably argue contrary. It's not up to me to say. But I think they have to be mindful of that because you're playing to an international audience here. And Israel, the, the, the worse Israel's reputation or the, it can, the, the more that Hamas and others can present Israel as the aggressor here, mm. which it is not, the more that plays into uh, a jihad uh, an ISIS style, an Iranian agenda. So we have to be very careful. Yeah. But when oh. people argue, when people argue for a ceasefire, this is just hugely naive. Just like the Russians in Ukraine, any ceasefire will be used by Hamas to strengthen their position. Yeah. So actually, every time you call for a ceasefire, you're just going to make it easier for Hamas to kill people. Yeah. It's incredibly naive. Look, I think Sadat Sadiq Khan is a I'm afraid to say, a lightweight mediocrity. He always has been. And the only thing he ever does is sort of pick arguments with people on Twitter and virtue signal. Uh, I really hope we get rid of him come May because he's a, a waste of space. Uh, yes, I, I, I just wish he'd rather worry about, you know, keeping people safe in London, the city which he's actually in yeah. charge, and rather than worrying about yeah. world affairs. Um, you mentioned Iran yeah. there. Um, there's this concern about this new axis of terror, uh, axis of evil against the West, you know, Russia... Um, uh, you, know, well, you know, you know, Russia and Iran and China, North Korea, but also these terror groups, the Hamas, uh, you know, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, um, you know, replacing you know, as ISIS and Al Qaeda. How concerned are you about everything spreading wider and these terror groups getting more and more access to the weapons they can use to well inflict their terror? Um, I'm really concerned because what we're seeing is uh, there's a bunch of trends, but none of them effectively are good. You're looking at the breaking of a global system into 
free states, authoritarian states, and there's a battleground for the middle for places like Africa, the Middle East, South America. Yeah, we're losing that battle, at, Bob. Uh, well, it, well, hold on. We, we are just beginning to enter that game. So I, I agree up till now, but not all is not lost. There is a second axis, which is a very close and closening axis now between the Mullahs and the Kremlin. So between Iran and Russia and the sharing of technology, uh, the Iranians want nuclear technology, the Russians want drone technology. So there's a very unhealthy relationship there. And there's the Chinese who are neutral, but sort of supporting indirectly, if you like, the Russian-Iranian uh, axis. So there are lots of negative dynamics. And within the Middle East, you're, you have Iran and its multiple proxies, effectively its overseas agents of terror, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, um, um, the Houthi in Yemen, a series of Shia groups within Iraq as well. Um, uh, and so you have all these groups around, controlled by the IRGC, who are effectively the agents of Iran. And what Hamas has done, the timing of this, just to remind people, is to prevent any normalization of relations between Israel and the Sunni world and primarily Saudi Arabia. And the more difficult that becomes, this is a problem for the Israelis, they need to destroy Hamas, we understand that, but the more difficult that normalization becomes and the more months and years it's put on hold, the more that Israel sadly plays into yeah. Iran's hands. Okay. So everybody needs to be careful. And our role has got to try to be to keep this normalization alive. Okay. That does not withstand the problems within Israeli politics and some silly politics around settlers in the West Bank. Okay, uh, really appreciate you joining us. Great to, to hear from you. That's Bob Seeley. He's a Conservative MP, member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and of course has served in the uh, Middle East as well. Um, let's come back to the studio. Uh, my guest still here, Ralph Scholhammer, who's a political uh, theorist and economist and uh, also Sam Armstrong, who's a commentator. Ralph, um, great to get you back in the studio. Now, we often talk to you about climate change issues and I actually want to come on to a little bit on that because I think energy security is a factor in all of this, what's happening. But what, what do you make of where we are right now with Israel, with Hamas, with, with you know, EU leaders calling for a, a pause and a cessation of violence, with backbench Labour MPs here calling for a, a, a pause and, a, and a, a ceasefire? Well, I think there are two things we have to distinguish. One, for, for Hamas and Israel, this conflict is about uh, Israel and Hamas, about their positions in the conflict. Conflict. But of course, for everybody else, it's about containing that conflict. And uh, somebody, uh, something that the, the member of parliament said before, I think was quite important. He talked about the rapprochement between Israel and the Sunni world. There is no rapprochement between Israel and the Sunni world. There is, there was kind of a, a better relationship between Israel and the leadership of the Sunni world. We tend when, to... when you talk about the Sunni world, yes. explain, because obviously there's two different we talk groups about, of... We talk about jo the... Jordan, Muslims. Saudi Arabia, particularly Saudi Arabia, yeah. Egypt, all these countries basically surrounding Israel. But there's a distinct we tend to forget in the West, which is that in these countries, very often what the leadership thinks is very different from what the people think. So Saudi Arabia, for example, Egypt, the same. These are regimes that stand on feet of clay. So yeah. what they are afraid of is if Israel and the, Israel has every moral right to make a ground offensive, absolutely. But what they fear is if you get pictures out of the Gaza Strip, yeah. if you have media like the BBC who go out pretty much with, I would say, fake news that Israel has been bombarding hospitals, mm -hmm. they are afraid that it will fire up their streets and that at some point you have a rerun of the Arab yeah. Spring, but then now getting to an energy question, but maybe then in Saudi Arabia. So, for example, if you yeah. would have hypothetically a Islamist revolution, an anti-Western revolution in Saudi Arabia, that'd be a huge problem for everybody involved. Yeah. And this is kind of the, and the, that's the thing, moment. You're right. We when we do talk about this, we talk about it as if Jordan thinks this, you know, um, Ram thinks this. You're talking about countries with huge populations, where, as you say, the leadership, you know, despotic authoritarian leaders. And again, people people say, why does the West back Saudi Arabia? Well, because look at the alternative. It's basically the Uranian Mullahs effect. That's what you're looking at. Let me give you one quick number to highlight this. They did a poll in Saudi Arabia just one year ago, and they asked the people, would you allow an Israeli prime minister to visit Saudi Arabia for an international conference. 7% said yes, and 93% said no, they don't want to have an Israeli yeah. prime minister set foot in Saudi Arabia. That's the reality on the Arab Spring. That's, that's what we have to deal with. And that is also what Israel is dealing with. Of course. Um, Sam Armstrong, it's, it's come to you. Um, it, it, we've discussed this a little bit earlier as well, of course, but again, these, these calls for people to say, you know, EU leaders or, or Labour MPs, some Labour front benches, when people are talking for a ceasefire, even a, a pause, now a pause meaning I think a few hours is normally the, the, the term people are meaning, um, but anything more than that, when people are calling for that, it is playing into the hands of Hamas, isn't it? Why do you think people are doing that? Because what do people expect to happen afterwards? Like, OK, so we're going to pause, we're going to let some aid in, might let some people out. Well, you know, people have got dual nationality passports. Well, lucky for them, 
But what do they think happens after that? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, it's not a ceasefire, it's a surrender. Mm -hmm. Hamas has had its attack. Um, Israel needs to defend itself against that, remove the, the militants, command and control centres, weapon stores from the tunnels. But I genuinely don't accept, I don't accept that Sadiq Khan, for example, doesn't know this. Sadiq Khan must know that what he's calling for is for Israel to basically suck it up. His yeah. genuine belief is that Israel should, oh, well, it's not that bad. It's only 1,400 Jews. But, but also, look, we, we, we know you want to strike back and we understand why, but, but then everyone will say bad things about you and therefore, and therefore you shouldn't. I don't remember America worrying about that after 9-11. No, but he believes in a hierarchy of suffering. You've got to remember this, it's built into the left. He believes that one of the most, it's built into every left-wing textbook, every left-wing movement at universities, the most oppressed people of all are those in Palestine. And that's why they're prepared to ignore, for example, the plight of gay people in Palestine, mm -hmm. where the Hamas's penalty is very simple. They will kill you. Yeah. They're prepared to ignore all of the human rights abuses because Hamas... It's Palestine... This is actually a pl out, playing out of, of identitarian politics, but on a global scale. Uh, Ralph Schulhammer? I mean, there, there's something nobody wants to talk about, so I think, but somebody has to say it. Let's look at the demographics of Europe. You have 4 million Muslims in Great Britain and 400,000 Jews. You have about 7, 8 million Muslims in France and about 500,000 Jews. Politicians know that, yeah. so they know what's happening in Israel uh, means that it, if they have to take sides, they know. which side do you well, think they're going to take? And we are seeing take? that, Paul, with, with uh, uh, clearly with Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, Absolutely. Um, and the backbench MPs, and the sort of outcry from, from councillors, and, and, and not just the sort of the Corbynista left-wing MPs, but many of as well. It's, and the awful thing is, you know, which side is your bread buttered? Basically, are you going to lose those seats? And, and that is a real concern, isn't it? Because these things should be matters of principle, not about, you know, well, ooh, have we got more votes in that neighbourhood than that neighbourhood? And we know, of course, the Jewish population, I think it's actually lower than that. I, think, I thought it was around the 250,000 mark in this country and a higher population of, of Muslims, perhaps 4 million able to vote. I don't know, but... Um, but you are looking at the the Jewish population in this country in very you know North London and in Manchester, in the vast majority living in Syria, and therefore not seeing that pressure, perhaps that that, that Labour MPs are getting from the much much wider uh, Muslim community. Well, principles pretty much went out of the window once the entire West signed up to the ideology of multiculturalism, which basically argues that every culture is the same anyways. Yeah. So there's no point in arguing about it. As we find out now, there are people in our countries that simply see the world differently. Well, well I mean, it's fascinating actually. One uh, MP has talked about how they're concerned about facing uh, facing violent threats. Uh, from people in his community and want you to speak out on the issue because of threats of violence. Now, are those threats of violence coming from, oh, I don't know, Israelis, uh, people supporting the Israeli group, or from Jewish Brits? Or you know, And we all know what we're talking about here, don't we? When we see people on the streets having a vigil for people who have died in that horrific massacre on October 7th, there is no trouble, there is no concern, there is no hounding or calling for people to be, to be you know, to have revenge or call... When we see the, the, the protests on the street, and there's going to be another one this weekend in London and elsewhere, uh, where you've got um, a pro-Palestinian rally, that's a perfectly legitimate reason for people to go on the streets to support those people and make sure that they, you know, they, their needs are, are focused on. I've got absolutely massive respect for that. But we do see these protests. For some people, and far too many people, it, it veers outside the I'm concerned about innocent people in Gaza to... Israeli hate, hatred of Israel and hatred of, of, of Jews. And, and, and that is a concern because we've basically said, as you say, in a multicultural country, that's OK. And, and this lack of integration doesn't just stop there. We saw last year in Leicester when India and Pakistan got, went into war, you saw Pakistani community on one side, the Hindu community on another side, going into actual fights, streets, riots on the streets, and that's the trouble when you don't integrate communities into... Now, the society. conversation, anyone, someone listening to this from you know, on the left will go, oh, well, this is a horror, you know, three white people with your privilege talking about this nonsense, um, and it's all bigoted and xenophobic. Got no issue with anyone with any religion whatsoever. Couldn't care less about people's skin colour. I do believe, though, that if were I to go and live in Saudi Arabia, which I would not do because I would not be willing to do this, I would feel the need to integrate, to, to take on the values and live. I just think that if you're going to live here, if you're going to raise your children here, you should, you should ascribe 
to the values of the country you've chosen to live in. No, and, and just to add on and to that this... That doesn't involve threatening people because they disagree with you. We, we have been told about 20 years ago that ideally Iraq should be broken up because Sunnis, Shias and Kurds cannot live in the same state because they're so different. And now at the same time we are told that it's no problem to have radical Islamists, Jews and, you know, liberal Westerners living in the same country where the differences are significantly bigger. I think we have to accept that, of course, if cultures hold different values and they live in the same society, at some point the risk of clashes and conflict is increasing. We see this all over the world. You're correct, right? You can always say, oh, this is just some white people who make this claim. But we see it. I'll give you one quick example. Sweden in 2006 had, I think, six murders. Now, as a consequence of the immigration policy, they have to send in the military into Malmö because they have gang wars with hand grenades, with dynamite that simply didn't happen before. Now, again, one can say, how can you say this? Well, but this is, this is the game we've been playing for 20 but years. But these are facts. These are facts, and we're not supposed to talk about them. This is always about you can be factually right or you can be, quote unquote, morally right. But I think if you constantly try to be morally right, you lose touch with reality. And this is what we see all and over the West. And people people on the ground, people living in, in European nations seeing this, we'll, we'll be seeing it. That said, I don't want a situation where people are in any way saying, oh, well, because someone is of a particular faith or, 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 or ethnic or, or, or national heritage, that they would subscribe, subscribe to this. Because actually the biggest victims of Islamist terrorists, whether it be Hamas or whether it be uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS, are actually Muslims. They're the people that they harm the most. They are the biggest victims of this. I don't think that the vast majority of people of the Muslim faith do remotely support these people. I just think we've got a lot of so-called community leaders, self-appointed, who think it's in their interest to say they do. Uh, and cowardly politicians that aren't prepared to stand up to it. There's yeah. countless examples on Twitter of just shocking hate preachers. Yeah spewing bile, absolute bile, about the Jewish community in this country over the past few days. All of them ha will have shaken the hand of their local MP over mm -hmm. the last few years. Well, and, and they not... should have misgendered them and then they would have been banned from Twitter. Qu quite. Hatred is hatred and I don't care what kind of gown it's got on it. And by the way, a lot of them would be prepared, a lot of Labour politicians in particular, perfectly prepared to call it out when it comes from the Christian community. I don't care what... Well, we've seen Christian preachers preaching, si praying silently being arrested. I don't care what brand of religion you're coming from. If you are spewing vile threats, and I say this as a member of the Free Speech Union, mm. if you're spewing vile threats of actual violence against members of British communities, you should not be welcomed into the corridors of power, yeah, period. It's very, very simple, yeah. isn't it? Um, very uh, final, quick yeah, word, I mean, But there's one thing we must not forget. The direction of a community is determined very often by the loudest money Minority and not by the silent majority. So if we say 90% don't yeah. want this, but 10% want it, very often the 10% call the shots and not the 90%. But this is where in all in all, in all communities, oh, yes. every community, the quiet the silent majority need to start speaking up. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph and Sam. I've been wanting to hear from you today. Uh, you can get in touch on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Um, Herbie uh, from London is on the line with his thoughts actually on the Israel Hamas conflict. Good afternoon to you, Herbie. What do you want to say? Julia, good afternoon to you. Well, this is, this is a no-win situation, Julia, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's getting worse. I mean, to say the despots around the world are flexing their muscles now. Now that this has started, you know, they're, they're anti-Israeli. They're anti-Western uh, European as well, a Western way of life. Yeah. They want to bring their own ideology around. And I'm afraid we're allowing it to happen. We're doing nothing about it to control this out-of-control uh, changing culture ways and everything else. Yeah. We're not allowed to say anything, we're not allowed to do anything, but they can do what they like, but we can't do nothing. Mm. And I, I think, think a lot of people feel like... that way. I, th I find it amazing how many people don't understand that these you know, these autocracies, the China, the Russia, the Iranians, but also these, these terrorist groups, these Islamist yep. extremists, they hate us and they want yep. to destroy us. I don't understand why people don't get that. <laughs> well, Julie, I mean, we've invited them in. We've actually allowed them to come into the country to do what they like. They can do and say what they like. They don't like our way of life. If they no, but but like the, it, the, I think, home. no, I think the vast majority of people who've come here who, who have, who have uh, maybe Muslim faith or someone who's, you know, escaped from Russia or China, they're coming here to make a better life for themselves and their families. All credit to them. Yeah, but the despots are taking over. I mean, say, they're so powerful, you know, with what their propaganda is so fast. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, say, they're brainwashing young children or young kids today to think that what they're doing is correct. Yeah, no, that, that is true. That is true. Over. 
Herbie, you talk a lot of sense. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. But I'm going to be very naughty. I want to come back to Ralph Shulhammer just briefly because we've had you on previously talking about you know uh, just issues about the, the net zero costs mm -hmm. and the like. And I, I did want to get to it just really briefly. Um, when we look at things going on in the Middle East, one of the reasons why America decided to go for the fracking, cheaper energy, but also not being reliant for gas on the Middle East. They've got they're obviously a massive uh, oil exporter as well. I think the second biggest in the world. I yes. think um, there are concerns, aren't there? Things going off, you know, not just in Ukraine. We saw the impact on our economies from the, the Russian invasion. What well, goodness knows what's going to happen um, uh, with an invasion of Taiwan by China. But there are big concerns. If things go off in the Middle East, that is going to have a huge impact on our economy as well. What does that tell us about what our energy needs should be? Well, it tells you once again that if, if you try to depend on others, right, if these others turn against you, you have a problem. And you saw this, as you correctly pointed out. I mean, right now, as we speak, almost every European nation is making long-term LNG contracts with Qatar. Qatar Liqu is one liquefied of the, natural gas. Exactly, as one of the major supporters of Hamas. So while we talk about solidarity with Israel, we basically fill the coffers of those who support and shelter the leadership of Hamas, that this is always the problem. Always look at what, what politicians do and not what, what they say, because unfortunately, very often, there's a huge difference. Really interesting. So good. I, I got that in. Ralph Schollhammer, uh, economist and political theorist at Webster University in Vienna. Thank you so much. Coming up after the break, a review into the closure of Nigel Farage's Coots Bank account has found a number of shortcomings in the process, despite lawyers agreeing that the closure was predominantly a commercial decision. Yeah, really. Well, we'll talk about that up next. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? <laughs> I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back, my little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. He's as up. fit as a butcher's dog. There you he's, go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. Well, I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this <laughs> girl. <but laughs> Get around. Man. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner <laughs> until you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place uh, where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Nigel Farage has hit out at the review into why Coots closed his bank account, calling it a laughable whitewash. An independent review organised by the bank found that his stance on Brexit and other political views were not, in fact, factors in why the bank's parent company, NatWest, closed down his account and that this was done for predominantly commercial reasons. However, they did find a number of shortcomings, in their words, in the closure process, including how NatWest treated his confidential information. I imagine they're talking about how the, the uh, boss of uh, Coots, Dame Alison Rose, thought it was appropriate for her to tell a business journalist at the BBC about his account at a private dinner and for him to put it all over the BBC News. She later lost her job. Big decisions still to be made about uh, whether or not Dame Alison Rose will get uh, more than £10 million that she's apparently due as a payoff, despite breaching her banking licence by basically revealing private client information to a journalist and admitting to it. Well, to discuss all of that, Sam Armstrong has been with us for the whole show. And uh, instead, now you're putting your free speech union hat on. That's right. um, and uh, let's talk to you about this, because Nigel Farage has, I think, understandably... So it called this a, a laughable and a whitewash and said that uh, particularly that Dame Alison Rose should not be exonerated, the former chief executive who resigned for what happened. Um, let's just go back to how this all emerged, because this was Nigel Farage revealing um, Coots I've been banking with for years, a private bank account and business bank account. Uh, they're closing my account and they won't tell me why. Yeah, all he knew of it was that this was a commercial decision. He had a call from somebody who we now know had been told, say nothing to him, just close it down and get off the phone, uh, had been shut down. He had to extract all of this information using this subject access request route out of them. And it's all there in this report from the law firm. And basically yeah. what this law firm has concluded is, right, well... NatWest Coots, they decided to have a meeting because they didn't like Nigel Farage, where they discussed his bank account. Then when they were there in the meeting where they said all these awful things about Nigel Farage, they said, ah, it turns out under this detailed criteria, we can get rid of him for commercial grounds. Then we're going to bin you for commercial grounds, but at the same time crowing to ourselves yeah. about how much we enjoyed it. And then, oh, voila, this law firm appointed by NatWest happens to be one of the wokest law firms in British legal fact, 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 system. In fact, this is one of the, the lead figures in this. He's someone who's you know, railed against Brexit, for instance. And he, I wonder if he's got a, I wonder if he's got an axe to grind. And what, lo and behold, what has he concluded? Oh, no, this was all fine. It's all fine. It's all kosher because, well, there was this justification. I mean, it's for the birds. Yeah. I mean, th this is the legal advice that money can't buy. <laughs> Absolutely. Your... What do you want us to say? But this is the thing. This, I mean, uh, Nigel Farage said as soon as this, this firm was appointed uh, that Travis Smith, that it looked it was going to be a white and of course it would be. We've had a financial conduct authority investigation as well, bearing in mind that the man who is the head of the board of NatWest, which is the owner of Coots, the plot thickens, by the way, uh, is Howard Davies, who used to be the head of the financial conduct authority. Let's get, you know, keep going all the way back. Um, that they basically concluded, no, they didn't think there'd been any wrongdoing, despite actually not investigating the information which Nigel Farage managed to get from these subject access requests. They say we talked about them earlier on the show, a little bit like sort of detailed freedom of information requests. And he managed to get a 40-page dossier. He's now got more information that he presented this week about not just what they were saying about him in reports, but what the WhatsApp groups within the bank were saying about him. And it was all about, yeah, we hope you drive him out of the country. Oh, you know, and they, they're wishing... I mean, some of them were, like, wishing him, you know, a, a violent death. Um, I mean, they were pretty, pretty unpleasant. They were absolutely foul and vile. And it was an awful lot of banking staff virtue siddling to each other about, oh, how ghastly Nigel Farage is and isn't it great we can get rid of him? Oh, I'd love to be the person who made that phone call. The idea that anyone, having seen that evidence, could claim, no, this was really largely about commercial reasons. He didn't have enough money in his account anymore. That, well, that was why his... Uh, to, to, you, know, you have to be very rich. You know, the Queen's bank account was held there. You know, that, that, that was the reason why. Despite the fact that we knew, when this was first published by the business editor of the BBC, that he'd been told by a senior source. We now know the chief executive, Sir Alison, Sir, sorry, Dame Alison Rose, at a dinner. He'd sat next to her the night before at a dinner and she'd whispered in his ear, no, it was commercial reasons, didn't have enough money. Um, again, a complete breach of a job, sacking offence on the spot, as far as I can tell. Um, but but, uh, but uh, we know, I mean, thousands of people came forward and said, but I haven't got that money in my account. I haven't got two million in my account either. And, and I've not had my account closed. 
Yeah, and by the way, they also refuse to give him a regular NatWest bank account yeah. that anybody can walk in off the street and get hold of. But this is why they need to stem the flow here. Because, look, Julia, I'll tell you, at the Free Speech Union, we have heard from hundreds of organ not hundreds, right, but a series of organisations yeah. that over the years, church groups, local political parties, etc., etc., that have all, res all had similar treatment. They've had their bank accounts shut down. They've been refused bank accounts. Richard Tice couldn't get one, for example. For the reform... And Party. And by the yeah. way, we've had bank employees that have been illegally discriminated against, cases the Free Speech Union represented, for expressing uh, opinions considered to be unwoke. So they have but, to stop... But, but, but perfectly normal majority view opinions. Exactly yeah. right. You have, they have to stop it here, because once the public realise, once the authorities realise just how out of control some of these woke activist, political, yep. banking organisations, and how little they care about their customers, mm. how much they care about expressing their own views. But, but they don't even... They're we in crisis. But they don't even seem to care about, you know, their, their own profits. I think a lot of people find it quite bizarre. They'll think, oh, well, the BBC are going to be woke, the Guardian's going to be woke, maybe a load of academics at some lefty, you know, former polytechnic university. But what I think most of us find utterly perplexing is that, you know, a bank for rich people, Coots, Nat West, I mean, these people, they're just concerned about making money. No issue with that at all. Why are they getting involved in these politics? And this is where the conspiracy theories start, but it's also where there is a lot of truth in some of those conspiracy theories about what is motivating a lot of decision-making going on at these organisations, whether it's the big banks, whether it's other organisations, and a lot of it is about sort of how you're graded on these sort of international metrics for your virtue signalling. Um, and a lot of it is not just about you know, anti-Brexit and things like that. That's not a concern uh, in the rest of the world. But a lot of it is about, you know, identitarian politics, which we keep coming back to on this show, um, trans issues, diversity, uh, and multiculturalism, all of this. And... And you just get into this spider's web of you have to tick a lot of boxes. I think... I, I said to Nigel at the time, I said, I don't think this is even about Brexit. You've been a Brexiteer for years. I think this is about your views on trans issues because we have seen more people cancelled over that than over anything else. Big businesses have, across the board, gone mad. Many of them are pursuing the so-called B Corp status. You where they have what to that is. B Corp is this global body that says, we certify that your business has a social purpose. In actual fact, what that means is you subscribe to all the left-wing rubbish we hear about day in, day out. But it's White really privilege, bad, all of white that privilege stuff, White yeah. privilege and uh, pro-trans stuff, all the rest of it. But it's really bad for business. We saw with Unilever, they've just had to appoint a new CEO because their last CEO said... All of our brands, every single one of our brands, Hellman's mayonnaise has to have a social purpose. <laughs> and investors, they said, we're holding stocks in you. What on earth our are we paying? Our pensions are in there. Yes. What on earth are we paying you to come up with a social purpose for Hellman's mayonnaise, Coleman's mustard, Pear's soap and all the rest of it? Mm. And now what happens? What the, the stock market price crashed, yeah. the CEO was binned and they're having to build up again. But that is coming for CEOs Big business. Yeah. Uh, oh, I hope. I mean, I would go, won't go broke. I mean, that where shares fell 16% uh, in early trading yesterday uh, uh, as a result as a result of this. And what about this finally, Dame Alison Rose, though? Um, she she had to resign. She's on a 12 months garden leave, so she's on full pay still. That's the terms of it. I'm not quite sure why. She committed gross misconduct, as far as I'm concerned. I still find it extraordinary. The majority of the NatWest board backed her. Each one of those people is unfit to hold a banking licence, in my view, and should be ousted. Um, but she's up for it more than 10 million, some are saying even 11 million pound payoff. Um, we understand that basically they're trying to negotiate this. If she doesn't get her money, she's going to sue them. I mean, I don't see on what basis. I'm assuming that she knows where the bodies are buried and she's basically going to point the finger at everyone else so she's going to get a load of money. Again, rewards for failure. And by the way, we, the taxpayer, still own 40% of that bank. Single biggest shareholder is not the big business. Yep. It's you, it's me, it's everybody listening and watching this. Mm. It's your yep. money. It's our money. Yep. And it's not just taxpayers' money. It is our pension fund money. E exactly so. And by the way, when Jeremy Hunt wants to put up taxes next month, OK, when he wants to keep the tax rate the highest level it's ever yep. been since the Second World War because of extraordinary circumstances, no! Take the money <laughs> from her, rather than taking well, it out we'll of we'll our take hard her hard Yeah, exactly. I'm with you on that. Um, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll, we shall see what happens. Uh, Sam Armstrong, thank you for that. Your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this afternoon with your reaction to the government's COVID disinformation unit monitoring critics, including me, uh, during the pandemic. They branded me a known vaccine sceptic, which I wasn't. Uh, I just what, didn't like vaccine passports or kids having to have vaccines to go to school.
call me old-fashioned, and they even shared information about me with the US counter-terrorism unit. They've now apologised. Now, Roger's got in touch. He's quoted Socrates saying, when the debate is lost, slander becomes the tool of the loser. Stephen has tweeted, take note, next time anyone from the government speaks, do not simply accept it as truth. And Will says, uh, we are supposed to be the heart of democracy in a country of free speech. What sort of world do we live in? Yeah, we all learned a lot of lessons over the last few years, didn't we? Coming up after the break, NHS waiting list could top 8 million by next summer, even if doctor strikes end. I'm Julia Hartley-Brook. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, NHS waiting list could top eight million by next summer, even if doctor strikes end. The ever growing backlog hit a record 7.75 million in the latest month. Forgot figures for that was August. That means the equivalent of one in seven people in this country right now are waiting for routine treatment. Well, researchers blamed strikes by junior doctors and consultants for clubbing, clogging up efforts to clear the COVID backlog. Backlog, but, of course, a lot of that backlog was there long before COVID. Joining me right now is one of those patients affected by that long waiting list, and that is Jamie Hale. Uh, good afternoon to you, Jamie. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Well, you are one of the one in seven people currently on a waiting list for health treatment. Uh, we don't need to go into you know, what health treatment you are waiting for. That's a personal matter between you and your doctors. But how long have you been waiting? I've been told, I think, for at least the best part of the year, a year, if not longer. 
that I'll be having major surgery probably in the next three months. And each time that three months gets pushed further away. Um, meanwhile, earlier this week, I had a procedure unexpectedly delayed and the next available slot was, I think, four or five weeks in the future. So it just means that patients like me are kept waiting, yeah. kind of trapped and unable to really move on with our lives. And yes. the You've got, no, you can't make any plans. I mean, you, you can't plan to go anywhere. I imagine it affects things like work, uh, you know, family events and, and just presumably, I mean, also for major surgery, I mean, you know, that's a major, you know, it may be routine, a lot of surgery that people get, that doctors think of it as routine. It's not routine for the patient. That involves, it's, it's quite traumatic and you're sort of, you're having to gear yourself up for it and then the appointment never happens. Indeed, and it's, it's challenging, it's frustrating. It makes even short-term planning difficult. It's had a huge impact on my work life, my family life, everything, and it's so difficult to see this and to think looking back you know 10 12 years when i was equally dependent on the nhs and it feels like this situation just didn't happen and that after so long of kind of successive underfunding we've ended up in a situation where patients are sometimes on waiting lists for years even for an appointment let alone for treatment yeah. I mean, I find it extraordinary, you know, just how long it takes people to get an appointment, say, with a concern about breast cancer, to get an appointment with a consultant. And when we know that weeks, are the, you know, a couple of extra weeks, extra 5% chance of dying. I mean, it, these are this is about life and death matters. And, and for a lot of people also, say, maybe your position where it's just about, you know, ability to just live your life uh, in, in some kind of uh, comfort and, and, and uh, um, getting on with it. Um, do you feel... I mean, do you feel angry? Do you feel... Sad. I was like, what, what's your main emotion about this? I suppose I feel really angry that we're in a situation where there has been such successive underfunding of the NHS that these waiting lists have become normalised, that the idea that patients should just be expected to wait, should have to wait. We used to have an NHS that we could be incredibly proud of internationally. And now what we have is a creaking system where we're reliant on doctors to do their best in situations they've never wanted to work in. People well, you... don't become doctors to sit there and say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait another however long. They don't become doctors to have those conversations. They become doctors because they want to be treating patients. And increasingly, it seems like their job is reduced to not being able to achieve any of the things they well, really I'm, need. I'm the daughter of an NHS GP, so I mean, I've got other members who worked in the healthcare service uh, in, in my family. I mean, I can, I can understand those motivations, but. You kept, you've said twice now that this is, you know, underfunding. Um, I know a lot of people point out, well, actually, you know, it's had a real terms increase, even in the austerity years, 2010 onwards. It's now got the biggest funding ever. A lot of people say, well, it's got the funding. Yes, we did miss out on years when it didn't go up as much as it had gone out under the Blair and Brown years, indeed, the years before then. And that has meant that it perhaps didn't keep pace with the extra need of an older, more obese population and the amazing amazing technical breakthroughs and drug breakthroughs which had cost more money to, to give people. But there is a concern that there's plenty of money, and but ultimately it's a bottomless pit, and it's that the money isn't spent on the right things rather than uh, there isn't enough money. What do you say to that? That wherever I've been in the NHS, it's been really striking the impact of there isn't enough money. You know, I've been in hospital wards, where the only way that they could cool us down on 38 degree days was gloves with ice and to hold on to. I've been in situations where they've had to say, we don't actually have any pillows left. There are no pillows. Will a rolled up blanket do? Now, hold on a minute. You said that, OK, do, do most hospitals have air con in this country? No, most buildings don't have air con. Do, I, I thought air con's probably not very good for a, for a hospital either with spreading of disease. Um, but I would have thought a lack of pillows I wouldn't have thought that that is actually a, 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 a money funding issue. I would have thought that's just an abject failure of bureaucracy issue and not ordering enough or not having enough through the laundry on time. That's what I would interpret. I, bet, I reckon if I could go into that hospital, I reckon I'd make sure there were enough pillows and it wouldn't cost a single penny more. I think the thing is that there are so many different areas where we can see this impact. Mm. You know, in the same admission, I had nurses just come into my room and sit down and cry because I was in a side room and they were so overwhelmed and overworked yeah. and they should have gone home three hours ago, but there were treatments that needed doing that the agency staff weren't qualified to do, so yeah. they stayed. 
And that's not a situation that we should be in. No, we can afford to have a properly resourced NHS. We, 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 we pay enough taxes for it, don't we? Just finally, I mean, what's the next date you've got, most likely date for your surgery? I've got something coming up in four or five weeks, maybe, hopefully. Well, yeah, and hopefully. And with the more major operation, who knows? But what I do know, ultimately, is that I look at the government and they're the people that I hold responsible for this. OK. I appreciate you joining us, uh, James Hale. Um, waiting oh, for over a year for a major surgery. I, I wish you the very best. I hope you do get it soon um, and, uh, and, and all is well. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for that. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's come back to you, Sam Armstrong. Um, I could see your face when he was talking about underfunding. Come on, off you go. Well, look, the NHS has got more money than it's ever got before. And some of that money is going to NHS consultants who I've got no problem with, but are on significant six-figure salaries. What's wrong with a, What's wrong with someone who's gone through years of training, does incredibly hard work um, and very skilled work, earning a six-figure salary? You've got, you got, you got HR directors in local councils Julia, earning six-figure salaries, for God's sake. There is absolutely nothing wrong with them earning six-figure salaries. What there is wrong with is them going on strike when people like Jamie are getting their... OK, the strikes are exacerbating the problem. Covid lockdown exacerbated the problem where they shut down NHS care to everyone who was uh, who, who didn't have Covid. Um, and the, basically, they, they literally said, we're just going to allow people to die off. We don't care because we only care about Covid for political reasons. And people need to go to prison for that. I'm sorry, I, I know I bang on a bit. That, they, they knew what they were doing and they did it anyway. But this has been ongoing for a number of years. There is no doubt that despite many of the good points about it, the NHS is not doing well. Even Labour, the Labour Has Party it got enough this. money? It, you know, we're older and we're fatter. We're going to cost more The NHS is not doing well with what money it's got compared yep. to countries around with the world. With similar funding. With similar funding, with lower funding. We have, we have fewer doctors per head, fewer um, nurses, uh, fewer well, every technician, uh, fewer hospital beds. And when it comes to the nation's health, I don't think anything can be off the cards. We, we must look at big reform, if big reform is necessary, in order to make sure that, that people like Jamie get their surgery when they need it. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, that's the thing. I can't imagine what it's like someone going through that, waiting again and again and, and not getting it. And again, the sharp elbow of middle class is we're seeing more and more people turning to the private sector. Of course, those people have been trained in the NHS and are actually often working away from the NHS and therefore you're taking more services away from the NHS. Sometimes on their strike days, on their running strike, off to yeah. Harley Street where is, they're charging Arab billionaires. It is, it is a, extraordinary, a isn't it? Sam Armstrong, it's been an absolute pleasure having your company as strident as ever and we love that. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you you so much for tuning in today and all week. Up next, it's Kevin O'Sullivan. Next week, I'm off and it's Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips in this lot. Have a great afternoon. This is Talk TV. We're here. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored, in New York City. Very impressive. Well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home,
be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah. Problem oh, solved. Yes, yeah. Problem solved. Things as fit up. as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. So I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> film. <but laughs> Get back man. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather